it's deeply, deeply honored to be here. Thank you for the invitation. And I know that it's going to be tough to entertain you in the first talk, 9 a.m. in the morning, and tell you about basic science. So what I decided to do, and it's very loud, so I'm going to put it down, so you probably can hear it better. Is that okay on the back? Yes. So I'm going to combine three things. One is my love of art, combined with it. You know, we're celebrating the Hispanic Heritage Month. So one of my favorite artists of all time is the woman behind me, Frida Kahlo. So I'm going to combine that. How I combine the art of the life of Frida Kahlo with my experience with vaccine. And the whole idea of the whole talk, if you can get one thing, is I'm going to try to convince you that all the courses that you have to take in basic science are going to actually help you to be a vaccinology lady. Okay? The final thing I'm going to say, I'm going to shut up about the things I'm going to convince you, is I do not take questions from faculty and senior people attending here. The first talk, or first question, I'm sorry, has to come from you. Is that a deal? Okay, let's go. So, I'm going to tell you a little bit about the alpha vaccine. And let me see if I can get here. Okay, so vaccines are like a canvas. Basically, when we are asked to develop a vaccine against a pathogen, you name it, could be a virus, a bacteria, a parasite, your favorite pathogen, this is what we end up. This is what normally we know, probably nothing about the pathogen. If we talk about SARS-CoV-2, we didn't know anything about it. So this is what we have to do. And at the end, we have to come out with a beautiful painting about uh, what we can develop as a vaccine. So from white canvas to a masterpiece, it can take you years. Or, like in the case of SARS-CoV-2, only took six to eight months to develop a vaccine. It's how fast can we do it. Do you know who this guy is? Have you heard about Edward Jenner? He's the first guy that developed vaccines, right? So actually, you can go to a museum and see a painting of Edward Jenner in a, in a museum. And, and, you know, vaccination by Ernest Bohr. So, how about Frida? What is Frida? So probably you hear, you saw a movie with the, my other favorite artist, Salma Hayek. Eh. It doesn't tell you about the story of Frida Kahlo, but the, the, the thing I want to tell you about Frida Kahlo is she was a woman of a, a lot of talent. She was one of the first uh, female artists in Mexico that was recognized. And the way she expressed herself is, is portrait. And she was trying to express the pain and the suffering and the environment that she was working in or you know, growing up or developing. One of the things that probably you heard about Frida Kahlo, she, she was in an accident, she suffered from this accident for many, many years, and the constant pain actually caused the changes in the art that she was expressing. So this is, you know, she got married to a famous painter, or muralist in Mexico, Diego Rivera, and that's what she was. So you can go from Frida Kahlo, the early stages of the disease, to Frida Kahlo after all this uh, you know, suffering and the pain. So if you translate this to vaccine, you can say that sometimes you have Fridas because you have some knowledge, and eventually you end up with Kalos, that you try things and they don't work. So I'm going to tell you about uh, two bacteria that we study in my lab. I can bet you you never heard about this bacteria, and that's why I want to introduce you to them. One of them is Borfoderia, Borfoderia malia, that's the species name. And the other one is Borfoderia pseudomalia. Why are they important? Well, for those taking, I hope anybody has, has taken a microbiology class, they tell you about gram-negative bacteria, gram-positive bacteria. These are two gram-negative bacteria. That's how they are staying with what you do in the lab. They cause two diseases, glanders and myelodosis. Again, probably you never heard about these diseases. And the interesting thing about it is this bacteria can actually enter our cells. And the bacteria can actually grow inside of our cells, replicate, and cause
of these things once they are inside of our cell. So that's one of the characteristics of these bacteria. Okay, so that's what we know. Uh, it's a gram negative, no motile bacteria, and can survive in our cell. That's what we knew about this bacteria. Why do we got interest? Well, in my laboratory, we work in the Galveston National Laboratory, where we work with all these different pathogens that can cause disease uh, naturally or man-made. One of these diseases, Burkholderia malleus of Flander, actually is the only pathogen that actually has been used as a bioweapon. Uh, it was used in World War I and also in World War II. So the people that developed this bacteria and they modified this bacteria, they actually released the bacteria, got the horses infected and also the soldiers infected. They just waited, the people got infected and then they attacked them. So that was the first bioweapon. So uh, the government here in the United States, the Department of Defense, has always been interested to develop vaccines against these pathogens. The other pathogen is called Burkholderia pseudomalia. It's very similar to malaria, but this one is a pathogen that you can actually find in the environment. If you travel to tropical areas around the world, particularly Thailand, uh, Myanmar, Northern Australia, you can actually get infected when you go into the field, to the rice field, and then the bacteria can enter through your skin naturally. Or if you go to Australia and you get caught in a monsoon, you can actually inhale the bacteria. Or uh, the other thing that you can actually acquire these bacteria is through the gas intestinal tract. So food or water contaminated with these bacteria can actually uh, infect. So why are we studying these bacteria? Well, it turns out that this year, we actually found, we, we don't, uh, the CDC actually found this bacteria in Mississippi. Uh, two people that uh, got infected died from the infection, and they actually found it for the first time in the soil of Mississippi. We have had two cases here in Texas. So the bacteria is here around us. It doesn't cause a lot of infection, but uh, with global, uh, you know, this climate change and all these changes that we are seeing, Potentially, this bacteria can adapt and start causing more infection. So it's better to be prepared. So that's all we know about these bacteria. So now develop a vaccine. What do you do? So that's the challenge for you. That's what, what basically the government follows in my lab. So we have these two bacteria. This is the information that we have. We want a, vac a vaccine developed in two years. Here's the money. Figure it out. So how do we do it? Well. We go to Frida, and we ask Frida, what can we do? So Frida is wearing this traditional dress. It represents the south of southern part of the of Mexico. It's in Oaxaca. And the interesting thing is, basically, she was trying to express the beauty of Mexico. And she's wearing this dress and beauty, you know, showing you know, all this dress uh, outside of her and the beauty that are giving her because of wearing this particular dress. So bacteria also express different things on the surface that we can actually study. Not like Frida, not as beautiful as Frida, but these bacteria can actually use these surface structures and we can understand them. And we can use them for developing vaccines. So one thing that we did is Again, going to the basic science, and if you have ever taken genetics, I hope anybody has taken any genetics class, we can actually create mutations. We can use that information to create mutations. So inactivate genes in this bacteria and make it less virulent, so unable to cause disease. So we create a mutation in a process that is natural for this bacteria. So this bacteria, we know that Iron is required for any living thing to survive. If we don't have iron, we die. So the same with bacteria. If bacteria doesn't have iron, the bacteria cannot replicate, cannot multiply, it cannot cause infection. So once the bacteria goes inside of our cell, the iron concentration is very low. So the bacteria has a hard time surviving. So it has to have mechanisms to sequester this iron from the cell and survive. So we ask the question, can we inactivate 
one of these genes that now they make the bacteria unable to use R and then unable to cause disease and use that as a vaccine. So we did that. So we inactivate the ability to use R. The other thing that we inactivate, we realize is that this bacteria is able to, once infect one of our cells, the bacteria can move from cell to cell, infecting this cell and then moving to the next cell without leaving the intracellular environment. So we figured out that if we inactivate another gene that makes the bacteria unable to move from cell to cell, we trap the bacteria in one cell, and then we let the immune system to attack the bacteria and actually produce an immune response that protects against the infection. So we inactivate. So basically what we did is inactivate two genes, again, the basic genetics inactivate two genes, and then unfortunately we have to use an animal model to test whether this uh, vaccine works. So we use this mutated bacteria to vaccinate these animals, and then we challenge the animals with a lethal dose of the bacteria, the wild type bacteria, to see if the animals survive or the animals die. Are we all with me? Are we following me? Good, super. But remember, you have to ask me questions. So, and then we can do aerosol challenge, and we can shoot. Uh, if you have taken an immunology class, we look for antibodies or for cells that are actually involved in the immune system responses, and then we look for those. We can actually quantify whether we have an increase of those cells once we vaccinate. We will have increase of antibodies if we vaccinate. And then we look for safety and efficacy. We don't want the animals to get sick with the vaccine because eventually we are going to be using this in humans. So basically what we do is we vaccinate three doses of the vaccine to these animals, and then we challenge with a little dose, and we take the organs and examine whether the bacteria can actually move to the different organs and whether the wild type bacteria can survive. We can do predictions. So once we vaccinate these animals, we can take serum, blood, and then take serum from these animals and quantify how much antibodies are being made. And again, basic immunology, if you see an increase in antibodies, you can predict whether these animals are going to survive to the infection. If these animals do not make enough antibodies, we can predict that these animals will not survive the infection. So that's what we did. We challenged, we vaccinated the animals, I'm sorry, with different doses of the vaccine. And we saw with uh, this dose of the vaccine, the animals made 20,000 units of antibody. But if we challenge with this, uh, I'm sorry, immunized with this vaccine dose, we got 42,000. So our prediction was that these animals will not be protected, or slightly protected, and these animals will be protected. So we did the experiment, and then the animals that were not vaccinated, they died from the infection. The animals, with a low dose of the vaccine, and 70% of them survive, 100% of the animals that got the three light dose survive. So we are going in the right direction, right? So it seems like the vaccine is working. So can we define the course of protection? So what can we understand better how these immune responses in our animals are producing the protection? Well, uh, people in my lab went to spring again and ask Frida, can we try to understand or figure it out, how can we do this? So Frida, uh, same things evolved uh, before, it was just trying to show the beauty of Mexico, and eventually Frida started asking the basic questions about uh, the hum the, her own humanity and how she saw herself in the Mexican culture. So at one point during her career, she saw that Frida was two Frida, not just one Frida. The Frida that was interacting with people in Europe, and the Frida that was a true Mexican Frida. That was that interaction. Of, and again, I, I don't have the time to explain why these things were happening. You can read a book about Frida, it's, it's exciting and interesting, but basically she was debating about these two, two cultures that were happening in Mexico. So she asked this question. So basically we say, can we actually figure it out the different components of these two Fridas in our vaccine? And that's what we did. Again, we do 
these challenges where we can get 100% protection of our animals with the vaccine, the animals that are not vaccinated, they die. And then we look for the bacteria in the different organs, and we saw that very, very few bacteria survive. It's not perfect. We've got some results for presenting some animals that have some bacteria, but I guess we were able to solve that. And then we start looking for the production of antibodies. Uh, for those that have taken immunology, you know that there is different types of antibodies, and each one of these antibodies have different functions, right? The common one that they ask you to do is measure IgG, and then you can actually measure IgG. There is an increase of IgG, indicate that you might get some protection due to the vaccine, and there is subtypes of IgG that we can actually measure, and we can predict whether these subtypes of IgG are actually being induced, and that can predict that we can actually protect these animals. Turns out that our vaccine produced IgG, IgG1, and IgG2 increases, and that's how we figure it out that the protection that we're seeing is due to these antibodies that we're being produced. Uh, I'm trying to make it very simple. Obviously, you know, there is a lot of thinking behind. Another thing that we can actually measure is whether there are cells not just the antibodies, but actually cells that can actually be induced due to the vaccine, and with those cells are participating in the protection. So, basic immunology class, the professor told you there is a humoral response, the antibodies, and the cellular response. And, you know, some vaccines are very good just inducing antibodies, and that's all you get. But some other vaccines, especially for intracellular pathogens, you have to have humoral response and also a cellular response. And that's why it's so complicated to have vaccines against intracellular pathogens. The best example, tuberculosis. <coughs> tuberculosis is an intracellular pathogen, and it's very difficult to develop a vaccine against tuberculosis. And this is the reason. So basically what we have is we can actually measure different types of cells, CD4 and CD8, these are T cells. And you can see that if you deplete these cells, you get increased infection. If you, some of them, you deplete CD8, nothing happens. So it seems like CD4 are critical for the cells. Okay. So I, what I have told you so far is that we can protect these animals from the infection. We eliminate the wild type infection, increase antibodies. Uh, we didn't see any damage in, uh, obviously, for the time. Being, I couldn't show you, but we didn't see any damage to the tissues. We didn't see inflammation. We saw CD4 T cells being induced. Persistent reduced eliminated. It cannot revert to the water because we have created two mutations. And they, they cannot become water. And it's a genetic immunocompromised one. So that's what we went back to the part of the fence and say, we have this vaccine. We're ready to go. We start ready to start testing. And they told me, well, this is a bacteria. Some people might not want to get immunized with a bacteria because it might be dangerous. So go back to the drawing board and figure it out a better vaccine that doesn't have the entire bacteria, but it only has one component or two components of the vaccine, and it still works. So here is the money, figure it out. <laughs> so what do I do? I go back to Frida, right? So Frida. Through the years now, she started having all these issues with health. You know, after the accident, she basically she broke her back and then she suffered a lot. And at the time, again, medicine was not as advanced as today. And she was really in constant pain. And you can actually see the progression of that pain in her paintings. One of these is, is this one in 1944, the broken spine, where she starts showing that, you know, she was suffering. But even in these paintings, you can look at her eyes, and there's people that dogs of teeth. This is my joke about pain and suffering. There's always the good thing about pain. There's always positive things about pain. So that was the pain that we were suffering at the moment that we spent all this time developing our vaccine, and we said, <coughs> well, maybe that's not the right vaccine. So we know that a lot of people, smarter than us, develop vaccines, and they develop different techniques to actually develop these vaccines. So these are many pathogens, and probably you here in college, you came and they told you you have to get the meningococcal vaccine, because you're going to be in dorms, or you're going to be in this 
everything. And they don't ask you. You have to get vaccine in order what you don't get into the universe. So many of these vaccines have actually been used different techniques to develop. But there is other ones, preventable diseases, that use different techniques. So we use the same methodology that they use for the medical a bioinformatics course. Raise your hand if you have ever taken a bioinformatics course. Fantastic. Guess what? It's actually useful. It's actually useful. So I went back to my lab and I said, how can we do use bioinformatics to figure it out what proteins that are expressed on the surface of the bacteria can actually work as a vaccine candidate or a component of a vaccine? So the very smart grad students in my laboratory, they say, well, let's, let's do bioinformatics, figuring out a few things about these bacteria. We're looking for proteins, and then proteins are structures that are on the surface of the bacteria that are conserved in, in vocal area, that are not present in any other organism. That was one. Two, that are on the surface, because once we get infected, the first thing that we see in a bacteria is the surface, right? So if we get antibodies against uh, surface bacteria, we can actually prevent that this bacteria enters our cells. So that's what we got. Uh, and then we're looking for trans uh, proteins that have less than one transmembrane domain. If you have ever taken a biochemistry course, and they told you that, oh, it's very easy to purify protein, tell your professor that's a lie. <laughs> if a protein is a protein that has multiple transmembrane domain, it's very difficult to get it out of the membrane, very difficult to purify. So our goal was to try to find proteins that have only one transmembrane domain that was very easy to purify, similarity to other antigens that have actually been discovered by other bacteria, similarity to another species, and again, those proteins that actually activate or induce the immune response. We can actually do that in a computer. You don't have to go to the lab. You can use be in the computer and, and type and use all these programs that uh, can figure uh, this out. So basically, my student, Laura Mulato, took the, the gene, the genome of this bacteria, and there's about 5,000 proteins. So that's a lot of proteins to figure it out. So she started using a bioinformatic approach. She looked for cell localization. She ended up with 160 proteins, uh, physical chemical properties, 132 proteins, Stability, uh, 106 proteins, oops, sorry, uh, antigen properties, 104. And I told her, when she showed me it has 100 proteins, I said, well, try to purify 100 proteins. And she said, I'm quitting. <laughs> so it's like, okay, let's try to rank these. So we took all these lists of 100 and we ranked them. We thought the best one to the worst one. And then we took the, the top seven and we start uh, trying to purify and clone it. So, very easy, right? So have you ever done a PCR reaction in your lab? Have you ever learned about PCR? So it's, you can amplify a gene, right? And then you can clone it, and then you can express the process. Guess what? Burkholderia doesn't like PCR. So Burkholderia, again, in the genome, when they teach you PCR, they told you you have to amplify the gene, right? One of the steps. And they told you, well, it's very easy. Just do the annealing and get it the gene, and you can amplify and you can calculate what primers you use and, and all that. That's what they teach you, right? These bacteria, the genes have about 70 to 90 percent easy content. So when you try to do PCR, it's impossible. The annealing temperature is like the 80 degrees, so it's impossible to amplify. Some of these proteins are very difficult. Sorry for those that do not. PCR experience, but this is basically a, a simple technique that we just do it. So we try to, you know, amplify it. These are the only ones, the ones in red, that were the only ones who were able to amplify and clone. And, oops, sorry. And these are the genes, and they are located on the surface, similar to what bioinformatics predicted. And this is what we start working. So we went back to Frida, and I said, what else can we do? So again, this is the latest stages of Frida's career. This is 1932, when she was in Henry Ford Hospital, suffering from many health issues. Uh, you know, you can read about it. 
uh, basically she was a lot, in a lot of suffering and she was trying to understand why uh, her own existence as an artist and a person in Mexico uh, was transcending you know, her humanity. And she was asking, well, there were different things in my life that have basically impacted my life. One of the things that we decided to do is take this example of you know, different parts and, I, and ask the question, can we use our basic knowledge? So they told you that I have a, a background in chemistry, right? So I can say, well, let's use my background in chemistry. Can we use basic chemistry to develop a vaccine to, you know, to assemble these proteins that now we have with basic chemistry? So we learned that actually we can use gold nanoparticles, very you know, nanotechnology, use that gold nanoparticle to put proteins on top of these gold nanoparticles. So we use chemistry to put these linkers on the surface of these gold nanoparticles. And then we can assemble the protein of interest, plus we can put carbohydrates or other things on the surface. So basically what you end up having is a gold nanoparticle cover with, a, you know, these products. And you can use that as a vaccine. So I'm giving you a question for me. So I'm not going to tell you why, but if you're curious to know why do we use gold, right? So you, there's a question. So you can type it. There is a QR code over there. So basically, if you have done purification in the lab, you can actually purify proteins. You can purify the uh, LPS or carbohydrates. And then you can do chemistry in the lab. We play with this chemistry, and then we, we assemble these gold nanoparticles, we put the linker, we can put the protein, and then we can engineer the lipopolysaccharide. This looked very good, it took us a year to figure out how to assemble this and how stable this, uh, this nano vaccine is. And eventually, my student Daniel Tapia uh, developed this vaccine. We can actually vaccinate these animals. And again, chance with a little dose of the bacteria, and ask the question: Can we actually develop an immune response that protects our animal, and we can get protection? So these are some of the examples of the proteins that we engineer with different combinations. And again, the first experiment, he came to my office, and he said, "Alfredo, it didn't really work very well. All the animals receiving different combinations, they all died." similar to unvaccinated animals. But there was two of them that seemed to be promising. This one in blue, again, it doesn't matter what the name of the protein is, two in blue that seems to be some protective, and then the one in green, it seems to give 90% protection. So we went back, we engineered, played around with these proteins, and the next time we did it, now we have proteins that actually protect 80 to 90%, and if we combine, the two proteins, now we have 100% protection with two proteins. So instead of having the whole bacteria, we can just use two proteins and we can still get protection. And this is, you know, the numbers of bacteria that we can find in the different organs. So it's not perfect. We're perfecting this to try to eliminate the bacteria in the different organs. We can get, again, looking for antibodies. We can get antibodies against the different proteins. And we can also get antibodies against the lipopolysaccharide. Remember, we put the lipopolysaccharide and the protein. So we generate antibodies against those two components. So just to summarize and to, to finish my talk, I hope I give you an idea that you know, playing around with the basic knowledge that you guys are getting right now, you can actually apply it to very complicated questions that we have in vaccine development. And you can combine you know, I'm not an immunologist, I admit that. So I have to learn immunology as, as I was going with this vaccine. So now I think I know a little bit about immunology because we can actually generate immune responses that are actually protective. And then we can actually start doing, sorry, we can actually start doing more complicated things to try to define what cells we have to induce with this vaccine to actually get protected. So that's a different talk that I think but at the end of the game, this bacteria, like SARS-CoV-2 causing COVID-19, the, the virus in, this, in that case started mutating, right? And then the vaccine that was designed for a type of you know, 
know, SARS-CoV-2 or causing COVID-19 starts mutating and the vaccine is not that effective anymore. So viruses, bacteria, parasites, figure it out that they're attacking them and they try to find a way to go around. So these bacteria is like that. It's very, very, I don't want to say smart, but finds a way to go around. So this is always in my lab to remember that even once the drama is sorrows in liquor, 